Barbados records 4.5% economic growth for the first half of the year. The way is being cleared for local suppliers to sell more products to cruise ships. We'll tell you how those opportunities are being created. Calls for more laws to regulate developments in Bridge in Spikes Down. And in sports, Matthew Wright leads off Barbados Olympic medal quest in seven hours. Broadcasting from our studios in the Pine St. Michael, this is CBC News Night, starting now. Good evening, I'm Pearson Bowen. Barbados has had its largest second quarter economic growth since 1998. This has been revealed by Governor of the Central Bank, Dr. Kevin Greenwich, who is reporting a 4.5% growth for the period. He says one of the major driving factors is an uptick in tourism. Rachel Egard attended that press conference and filed this report. Governor of the Central Bank, Dr. Kevin Greenwich, has given a stellar report on Barbados's economic performance for the first half of the year. And he's confident that the remainder of 2024 will see just as much growth barring an unwanted phenomenon. He says the improvement is spread throughout the economy and other economic variables reflect the same. We had a moderation of the inflation rate over the 12 month period, moderating to 2.7%. Unemployment rate continued to ease down, falling two percentage points to 6.9%. That's the unemployment rate. On the fiscal side, government fiscal operations resulted in a surplus on the primary account of roughly 509 million or 3.5% of GDP. Additionally, the governor says the last six months recorded the largest first half tourism performance on record with 18% growth. If I start with one of the CARICOM market, you have a 20% increase from 35,000 to 42,000 tourists. Other strong market improvement, Canada, the Canadian market, 20% increase, and this is the first half. The U.S. market drew off, had the largest increase, increasing by 45%, moving from just 82,000 to 120,000 um, tourists on island. And this, of course, reflected the strong performance in terms of the ICC men's uh, World Cup cricket. And also, we had increased airlift capacity. Now, the U.K. market is interesting. We had 136,000 tourists, roughly, compared to 137, so a slight decline not much and dr greenwich says this exceptional first half performance has translated to growth across all broad based sectors including construction manufacturing agriculture business and other services this resulted in 7.3 billion dollars in gross domestic product compared to 6.8 billion dollars for the same period last year However, the governor remains concerned there is not enough investment specifically on the private sector's part. I think investors are confident in the economy. Uh, we've yet to see some of it, some of that confidence to translate into investment in key areas. And with the inflation rate down to 2.7% from 4.2% for the same period last year, some Barbadians remain concerned those savings have not been translated to them in terms of spending power. What is the kind of inflation rate we would expect for a country Barbados? Historically, it's average between 25 and 3%. There's right? a reason for that. It's because we have a fixed exchange rate. And not getting too technical, and when you have a fixed exchange rate, you kind of import the inflation dynamics of the country which you are paid to. But Dr. Greenwich says in some instances, it takes about four to five months for some of the improvements to be passed on to the consumer. Rachel Lagarde, CBC News. Rachel, thanks. Well, joining us now to analyze that latest economic review is economist Professor Justin Robinson, who is also vice chancellor and the principal of the Five Islands campus of the UWI. Professor Robinson, good evening. Hi, good evening, Pearson. Good First, evening to you and your audience. Thank you. First of all, your overall assessment of the economic review. What do you think? Yes, so certainly if one looks at the numbers being reported here today, 
This is as strong an economic report as we have seen for the Barbados economy in 20 plus years. So if we look at the overall economy, the most widely used metric there is the growth in real GDP. So for the first six months, 4.5, that's above the first six month average for Barbados, so very strong overall. Some other key metrics, inflation at 2.7%, that has been running as high as 5, 6%. The unemployment rate is, is also down. If we look at the public finances, again, the government is running a bigger primary surplus, again, which is excellent. Foreign exchange, foreign exchange reserves at 3.2 billion up again. The debt to GDP is down to 105.3%. Again, significant improvements from being as high as somewhere around 170 and the financial sector is quite robust mm -hmm. with, cap with, with capital adequacy and non-performing loans, again, showing robust performance. So, so quite a stellar report. So again, if one looks at these numbers, it would be difficult to give a, a grade other than an A. Now, that's for you, the economist. But the home economist wants to know, with this drop in inflation, how is that passed on in terms of savings? How soon can they expect to see the change in their spending patterns? So, so I, th I think you're raising an important question. So these are macro fundamentals. But how does this feel or what are people experience? So the inflation rate is down to 2.7%, but that does not mean that prices are going to fall up. Huh? A lower inflation rate means that prices will continue to rise, but they're going to rise at a lower rate. So I don't think consumers should be holding their breath and expect prices to come down. Because it's important to understand what these metrics mean. You know, the inflation rate is the rate of change in prices on average. So once you have a positive inflation rate above zero, it implies that prices are going to rise. It being 2.7% compared to the higher figures in recent years just means that it's going to rise at a lower rate on average. The, the governor expressed some concern that private business is not invest, in, investing as much as he would like to see into the economy. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so I think that's one of the interesting issues you're raising. I, I have had the honor and pleasure of serving as a director of the central bank since 2008. And one of the interesting aspects of where we are now is that the economy is recording, I think, 13 consecutive quarters of positive growth. By a number of indicators, the economy is doing extremely well. But I've never had to work as hard to convince people that the economy is doing well. So there, so there certainly seems to be a disconnect between these numbers and how the average man on the street, so to speak, is feeling and what is happening in terms of business confidence. And I guess I have some thoughts and uh, some ideas as to what may be happening there. So again, one is the inflation. I often say for the consumers, people experience the economy in the supermarket and the labor market. So prices are still high. We've come off a very high period, so consumers are still not seeing their dollar stretch. In the labor market, we're seeing the unemployment rate come down. But, but also one of the interesting points in the report is that the labor force is shrinking. Hmm. You know, the percentage of the number of persons in, in Barbados who are seeking work and actively employed, that number is falling. So, so it means that there, there are a significant number of persons who are of eligible age in, to be in the workforce, but who are not either employed or actively seeking employment. And, right. and again, they may not be participating in this growth. I mean, that, that, that's a cause for some speculation there. Another perspective I, I think may be at play is is there growing inequality in Barbados in that 
while the economy is growing, the, the, the number of players, sectors, persons in the economy who are benefiting that from that growth may not be as widespread as it was before, which may explain the seeming disconnect between this AA plus report and the sense you are getting on the ground. It may very well be that there are some groups in Barbados, maybe people who are on relatively fixed incomes, mm -hmm. their salaries, their pensions are relatively fixed. Prices have gone up significantly. You know, their fuel prices have gone up. Yes. They're paying the health care levy. They're paying VAT on their online transactions and so on. So for these persons, they are not feeling that growth. Yep. And maybe that is translating to some of the concerns around investment. Because again, if you look at the World Cup, big event. But in my sort of informal conversations, a number of corporate players are saying they didn't really feel this event. So I think one of the things we need to explore is the extent to which there may be some growing inequality in Barbados. You know, Professor Robinson, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I wish we had more time to delve even deeper, but clearly this is a conversation to be continued. We really sincerely want to thank you so much for joining us this evening to share your perspectives. Thank you. You're very welcome, Professor Justin Robinson. In other news now, major steps are being made for more local businesses to get their products onto cruise ships. And this increase in business could lead to more jobs for Barbadians. Shurika Griffith has that story. Local suppliers now have an opportunity to sell more of their products to cruise ships. This is the outcome of a seminar connecting Barbadian business owners and representatives with primary procurement executives in the cruise sector. The event, called Provisioning Barbadian Products to the Global Cruise Industry, was held at the Hilton Resort. Minister of Tourism and International Transport, Ian gooding Edgel says there are significant benefits to be gained from the partnership with cruise lines. On the cost of the full summer cruise season this year, with Royal Caribbean and Celebrity Cruise Line scheduled to sail to Barbados through September, the use of local suppliers can ensure that there is an adequate supply of goods on board to minimize the occurrence of any shortfalls. Moreover, the use of locally produced goods can also assist in food waste reduction as a larger market is served by local suppliers. Most importantly, the sustained provision of Barbadian products has the potential to improve the livelihood of our citizens through resulting opportunities for job creation. Vina Jump is Associate Vice President of Global Procurement of Hotel, Food and Beverage Commodities at the Royal Caribbean Group. She says the world's second largest cruise line operator intends to develop suppliers in local and regional markets to become long-term partners. Ms. Jump stresses the group is committed to supporting local economies while growing its network. At Royal Caribbean Group, it is really important for us to support the local economy, especially on the Royal Caribbean International brand. I don't know if most of you know the FCCA, the Florida Caribbean Cruise Ship Association. I head the provisioning, for, I'm the chair for provisioning for the uh, FCCA, headed by Michael Bailey, uh, president of the Royal Caribbean International brand. We believe in investing and we believe in partnering and we believe in developing. It's our passion. It is in us. I'm not here today because I'm here today, one, because I believe in the organization that I work for. And number two, as I said before, I was born in Jamaica. And what I really want to see is my islands, our islands, there's so much more that we can do that we do not do, we do, not do today. During the proceedings, business owners and representatives had one-on-one -on -one sessions with Royal Caribbean procurement executives. Sharika Griffith, CBC News. The climate crisis took centre stage at today's CARICOM Heads of Government meeting in Grenada. And Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Amal Motley, is once again calling on the international community to do more. Crystal Hoyt filed this report. Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley has arrived at the 47th regular meeting of the Conference of Heads of Government of CARICOM here in Grenada. Previously scheduled for earlier this month, it had to be postponed due to the impact of Hurricane Beryl, one of the first matters on the agenda during today's meetings. Following the first business session, Prime Minister Motley spoke to me frankly, admitting that enough is not being done, specifically by the international community. 
clearly the experience of Hurricane Beryl and the arrangements institutionally that we have both regionally and internationally in order for us to be able to better prepare ourselves not only for recovery but for the building of adaptation um, and to become more resilient because I believe we have no more than a decade within which to do that. Um, and the international community has not been stepping up to the plate, either on the loss and damage fund or sufficiently on some of the other issues. We've made progress, for example, with the natural disaster clauses and other things, but we need to be able to ensure that there's a greater pool of concessional funds. Another major issue on the table is that of food security, which is at risk given the increase in both droughts and storms. We're all compromised and therefore we're trying to see how best we can prepare ourselves, both in terms of looking to see what are the opportunities for parametric insurance for our farmers at a regional level, um, so that when there is loss that they're capable of claiming. But at the same time, I think we're going to have to invest in far more climate resilient agriculture, which means doing some enclosed um, agriculture, not just open field, but doing agriculture also for a percentage of what we produce within the context of, 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 of greenhouses and other more secure facilities. That's going to take more planning, more financing, but I think it's going to have to be part and parcel of the equation as we go forward. As it relates to the goal of reducing the region's food import bill by 25% by 2025, Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, says given the devastation caused by Hurricane Beryl, it's simply not feasible. It, it has to move. Some countries would be still on target because they haven't been impacted yet. But this, this is always going to be a moving target. 2025 is an aspirational date, clearly. Um, and some progress was being made before. And now we have had a setback. As the heads of government continue to meet tomorrow, a number of other issues, including shipping, transport and the conflict in Haiti, will be discussed. Reporting from St. George's, Grenada, Crystal Hoyt, CBC News. Attorney General Dale Marshall and leader of government business, Santa Lisa Cummins, are seeking to clear the air on erroneous statements made by a leader of opposition business, Senator Tricia Watson, over a notice to debate the new bail act. In a release this evening, it notes the cabinet approved a new bail bill brought by the office of the Attorney General last Thursday. The release says in this case, notice was sent to the opposition leader and senators. However, none appeared for the debate, with only Senator Ryan Walters sending apologies for his absence. The statement reads, and I quote, It is unfortunate that we now have this position being taken by Senator Watson, who appears to be depending on the public's lack of background information on the working of the Senate to create what is rapidly becoming a necessary conflict. The statement goes on that, that it is unfortunate that in the interest of fairness and balance, the email was read without seeking to get clarity from the government or indeed the parliament as to what transpired or indeed what was their respective responses to the allegations. It adds that the government sees this matter of a new bail bill as critically urgent. And I repeat, it is only an extraordinary circumstances that they will debate a bill in all of its stages. But that is why early notice has been given and the meeting was held to review the draft with the Honorable Attorney General. End quote. We'll take a break here, but coming up, concern for the elderly amid a spike in COVID-19 cases. An appeal is going out to party goers enjoying the last lap of the crop over season to do what is necessary to protect the elderly from contracting COVID-19 amid a spike in cases. Director of Clinical and Diagnostic Services at the QEH, Dr. The Most Honorable Corey Ford, says while health authorities are monitoring an increase in cases, the four people that recently died from the disease are all elderly. He made the appeal while speaking on the Pulse radio show on QFM. It's okay for people to go party, enjoy themselves, etc. But if you are a, uh, 
a home provider for an elderly individual and think it follows on quite brilliantly from the last program, then you really, really, really need to look after those individuals at home in the way that they should. Um, it's something that's very close to my heart. Um, and, and when I say that, what I mean is this. So it's okay, you want to go party, have fun, et cetera, but be very aware if you have respiratory symptoms that these are the ones, you know, out of those people um, who would have been admitted, I mean, the, I mean, the average age is probably 70, 80 years old. Yes. And they're all elderly people. And the same stead, um, you need to be cautious at home, wear a mask, use hand hygiene around them if you know you have respiratory symptoms or if you came in contact with somebody who may have COVID or any other respiratory disease. Meanwhile, Dr. Ford says the Queen Elizabeth Hospital is taking major steps to combat antimicrobial resistance, one of the top global public health threats. He says the hospital has launched an antimicrobial stewardship team to look into how the country uses antibiotics. Recently, uh, we dropped on the ground antimicrobial stewardship pharmacists to look at now uh, some of the toxic or, or com toxic complications or and um, allergic or otherwise complications that can happen with people that are antibiotics. So we are doing a lot in country and Barbados um, is um, expected, um, I think, in September at the United Nations to floor um, a motion uh, with regards to antimicrobial resistance. That is going to be big. Member of Parliament for St. Peter, Colin Jordan, is calling for the creation and enforcement of laws for the developments in Spitestown. Mr. Jordan was speaking during a Barbados Labour Party branch meeting at the Alexandra School. He's warned the construction of what he calls ultra-modern buildings could result in the northern town losing its character. The town will lose its heritage if every deep pocketed investor knocks down buildings that have been standing for over 100 years, over 200 years. If that happens, Spike Stone will lose its character. It will lose its heritage. The town will lose its charm if buildings are erected that do not fit in to the existing architectural scheme. Mr. Jordan has also cautioned the Planning and Development Department against letting buildings run to ruin as he reiterated his call for Spitestown to be designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The MP has also reported progress in efforts to attract smaller cruise vessels to dock in Spitestown, with at least one expressing interest for the upcoming cruise season. But he notes this creates a need for a port facility and other infrastructure. Maybe some of the mega yachts will be able to pull up at the jetty. But those smaller cruise ships with maybe 150 persons or 100 persons will not be able to. And they have agreed that they would tender. They, they call it tendering. So they will attach themselves to mooring. I've been told that one mooring has been put down so far. This, is, this would be some mechanism in the sea beyond the, the jetty, beyond the reef, that allows the ship to anchor and stay in position while a tender vessel, which will be a smaller vessel that can pull up at the jetty, takes the visitors and brings them to the jetty. Time for Monday Night Sports as we're joined by Monday's man, Mark Seal. Mark, good evening. <laughs> good evening, Pearson. <laughs> Starting with the Olympic Games, where Barbados' quest for a medal at the Games begins tomorrow morning. The rain has stayed away from the river stain, so the men's triathlon is set for 2 a.m. Barbados time. Matthew Wright is our Olympian. And we're doubling up as later tomorrow morning, 5 a.m. to be precise, Jack Kirby will be our Olympian in the men's 100-meter freestyle. And we wish both of them well. Switching now to netball, where Barbados will battle Northern Ireland in a revamped Paradise Cup tournament starting next month. It gets going on August 23rd at the Wildy Gym. That's the first half in sports. Person, I'll be back later with a lot more. Looking forward to that, Mart. Thank you so much.
In business tonight, a call has been made for a meeting of the insurance and dental industries in Barbados. It's coming from Vice President and General Manager of Sajikor General Insurance, Paul Innes. He's asked for the meeting amid concerns that dental coverage has not moved for more than 30 years. Trevor Thorpe reports. The top insurance official says dental coverage has not gone unnoticed and has been getting attention in sections of the industry. He tells the business report the level of coverage is a personal thing. On the surface, it may appear as though uh, there hasn't been a change, but there are parts of dental that is actually included in what some people may know as the major medical cover. So it isn't accurate or correct to say uh, that it is not covered as a major medical. There, there are areas of dental care that is covered within the major medical component. And uh, we tend to take care uh, of those when, when they happen. He however notes coverage is not fully maximized by the public. The dental care provision for those who have it is well utilized. Uh, we have also seen that a lot of our customers don't necessarily max that particular benefit under their policy, but the utilization is very high. And you, you, you have to remember that the whole of, purpose of insurance is to provide, certainly from our perspective and from a client perspective, to provide specific cover for specific needs. The Sajikor Vice President and General Manager has also urged Barbadians to make greater use of preventative dental care. That is paid at 100% of the cost of medical care, uh, subject to uh, a relatively small deductible. And we spoke about deductibles earlier, right? So the whole idea that uh, dental care pricing or the benefit has not changed uh, is not quite accurate. The, I think we need to understand how the policy respond to different dental situations. The insurance official says the cost of insurance relates to the schedule of benefits and there's no one size that fits all. Trevor Thorpe for the Business Report. Time now for tonight's trading report. In Jamaica, Sajikor Select Funds Limited Financial with 2,746,059 units was the volume leader, followed by Victon Wind Firm Limited Ordinary Shares and Trans Jamaican Highway Limited. In Trinidad and Tobago, Massey Holdings Limited was the volume leader with 52,640 shares changing hands for a value of Trinidad and Tobago $185,775.33, followed by the West Indian Tobacco Company Limited. And here in Barbados, Epic Caribbean Property Fund SCC Value Fund was the volume leader, trading 16,255 shares at Barbados 55 cents each, and they were followed by Insurance Corporation of Barbados Limited and the First Caribbean International Bank. Mark Seal is back with more sports as he's promised. Mark. <laughs> Indeed, we're going to start back with cricket. The Barbados Tateball team returned home as champions of the 2024 Caribbean Tateball Triangular Series with St. Lucia and hosts Dominica. The series, which was held to also help select the West Indies Tateball team for next year's first ever T20 Tateball World Cup in Texas, saw a number of the local boys making the cut as we hear from Director of Tateball Cricket Barbados, Ellie Holford. Last week, not knowing the conditions, not knowing where we were going, just going on our own uh, experience. And then to get down there and to realize that we were years ahead of the competition. Uh, the guys, like I said, from day one took the time. Uh, took a little while, one or two overs to get in, but after that it was pure domination. Um, with that being said, uh, we took a 15-man squad, and out of that 15, 13 of the guys made the, the West Indies team. And so we now look forward to that, that choice series between USA, Canada, and, Bar and, well, and West Indies now. And then we look forward to the World Cup next year. Captain Desmond Currency and head coach Shane Ramsey were both pleased with the team's performance as they came out of the T20 and T10 formats unbeaten. We still have a very high standard in this team. Everybody knows each other. So it's just a matter of gelling 
together and, and coming out victorious in each and every game. Um, I thought this tournament was a success for the team. You know, it's, it's going to bring a lot of things going forward. Um, I think that the fellas were committed and um, obviously I had them well drilled. So we, we obviously intimidated the other sides. Uh, we, we started the plans and, and we came out successful. The recent Mortaring Club of Barbados full throttle double header event saw Dean Skeet yet again drive away as the winner. The sixth stage event was held in the north of the island. CBC's Trevor Thorpe reports on the action. Motorsport fans were treated to a total of six runs of the Josie Hill to Pickering's St. Lucy stage. 28 cars coming under starters' orders. It was the Morning Club Barbados full throttle double header speed event. Many of the usual drivers were out across the groups and classes as the winner would be determined by the fastest of their four runs. And here's your top five in the event number two. The only group M4 driver, Mark Thompson, in his Mitsubishi Lancer Evo 9 was fifth fastest with a time of 1 minute 51.53 seconds. The R5 class then state claim to the next three positions. Adam Malalu in his fourth Fiesta R5 with fourth, one minute 50.87 seconds. Logan Watson at the field of a Skoda Fabia R5 was third fastest on his final run, one minute 50.12 seconds. And second fastest was Josh Reed, who pushed his limits and he returned a time of 1 minute 49.71 seconds in his fourth Fiesta R5. And your winner, Dane Skeet. 1 minute 47.38 seconds at the wheel of a Subaru Impreza S12. He was the winner, unbeaten yet again. Trevor Thorpe, CBC Sports. And thanks, Trevor. That's it for Sports, Pearson. Thank you, Mark. With us our time tonight, thank you for spending it with us. I'm Pearson Bowen for the crew to all of you. Good night. By God's will, we will see you tomorrow.